Okay, we are going to try and stick to schedule. So we're going to get started. Um, I wanted to thank you all for being here. My name is Norit Brookhart. Um, I'm one of the directors here at Motion Property. Um, today, welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, we're gathered here to delve into topics that are crucial for anyone invested in the ever evolving landscape of the real estate and economics. Today, you'll gain insights that are not only pivotal in understanding current market dynamics, but essential for making informed invest investment decisions in the future. We are privileged to host this event with the expertise and collaboration of our friends from Blue Wealth Property, a leader in investment property research and education in Australia. Blue Wealth is known for its robust market research and educational offerings. The company focuses on empowering investors with high quality education and opportunities. Their unique, independently audited research methodology ensures reliable insights into property investments. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speakers, both from Blue Wealth, who will guide us through today's discussion. First, we have Dr. Tony Hayek, who is the CEO and founder of Blue Wealth Property. A prominent figure in the property industry, Tony is celebrated for his extensive insights and dedication to property education. He has enriched over 20,000 individuals with his strategies on building wealth through property investments. Joining Tony is Gavin Chow, Senior Re Research Analyst at Blue Wealth. Gavin is known for his sharp analytical skills and the ability to simplify complex data into clear, actionable insights, aiding investors in making informed strategic decisions. If anyone has any questions, please pop them through the Q&A function and we will address questions at the end. Um, without further ado, a warm welcome to Tony and Gavin. Thank you, Nurit. Um, very uh, proud to be here today, obviously to be asked by, uh, in our opinion, the best property management business in the country. And we've certainly dealt with a lot of them. I've been doing this now for 25 years and uh, Motion are certainly the top of the tree when it comes to uh, property management and looking after people's assets and looking after the tenants. Um, so to be asked to do an economic update and give you a bit of an understanding of where the market is currently at uh, is uh, pretty cool. So what I decided to do was delegate it to someone smarter than me and probably more handsome than me as well. So Gavin is our senior research analyst. Uh, Blue Wolf, we've been around for uh, 15 years. I started the business 15 years ago on, in January. Um, as Nurit said, we've educated tens of thousands of people. There are, we are a team of 25, as you can see there in that, uh, in that photo. And everything that we do is built on the foundation of research. Um, fundamentally, what we're trying to do is help people buy the right property in the right market at the right time. And you can't make those decisions uh, without research. Now, in saying that, we're also dealing with humans. And as humans... We're emotional, we're impatient, you know, uh, people uh, hold a property for two or three years, not much happens, and then they start getting nervous, interest rates rise, lots of noise in the media. And the reason why most Australians don't end up making or building wealth through property is because nobody helps them maintain the discipline of holding their property long term. And for us, uh, we're charged with that responsibility and we take it very seriously. So I'm going to hand over to Gav now, who is going to take you through the update. And uh, then I'll come back, and I'll come back at the end uh, and do question time with Gavin. Enjoy. Okay, thanks for that, Tony. Um, okay, I'll take you through the economic update. Uh, this is what we're going to look at today. Um, of course, we're going to look at the economy. It's an economic update. Um, we're going to look at interest rates. Uh, the real estate market is very kind of sensitive to interest rates. Um, you know, we can't really look at the economy without interest rates. Next, of course, we'll look at the Australian housing market. Uh, and then, of course, we'll look at some forecasts. All right, let's get into it. Okay, so we're living in opposite world. And so what does that mean? Um, it means that when, when there's bad news in the economy, uh, it's good news for asset prices. So it's a bit of a, a funny thing. Um, but the central banks have had the same kind of policy response since at least 1987. Uh, and that is simply to, when, the, when there's bad news in the economy or, or something bad happens, or some kind of a crisis, uh, they'll, they'll drop interest rates and then they'll print money. 
And the effect of this is that of all this sort of money sloshing around the economy uh, and, and becomes cheap to borrow, is it flows into the economy, but it doesn't flow into the economy evenly. So at first, it flows into something, um, into asset prices, so asset prices will rise, uh, and eventually it sort of works its way into consumer prices. Um, the guy who started this was a guy called um, Alan Greenspan. He was the chief of the Federal Reserve uh, in America uh, in 1987. And it was such a successful kind of strategy that they called him the maestro. Um, but what they didn't sort of take into consideration was that uh, there, were, there are a bunch of unintended consequences. You can't just print money and, and throw it into the economy and expect nothing to happen and not, no other things to happen. Okay, so asset prices go up. So through something called the Cantillon effect, the people that are closest to the monetary spigot, they make most of the money, uh, that is the credit worthy asset owners, the rich people and so on. And the people that are furthest, furthest from the monetary spigot, uh, they sort of get poorer. Uh, and that's because, you know, if you think about an economy and think about the cash in the bank or, or cash in your wallet, um, if a central bank creates it out of thin air, which they can do, and then simply throws it into this closed system. Um, the, the scarcity of each kind of dollar that you own sort of declines. So which means that it becomes uh, your, your purchasing power declines. And we sort of see this effect, uh, not as the number in your bank going down, your bank account going down, but rather as asset or, or as prices going up. And that be it asset prices or just the price of things like uh, groceries and fuel and so on. Um, now, the government has various ways to rob you uh, through taxes and tariffs and this and that. But this particular form of robbery, they call inflation. Uh, you might have heard that I don't know, in, the, in the newspaper or if you read the financial news. Um, and it kind of sounds like a good thing. Inflation, things are going up. But it's actually the purchasing power of your cash uh, declining. So you're sort of, in a way, getting uh, secretly taxed by the government. Um, at, the, at this point in time, most economic indicators in Australia are pointing down. So we have to keep this framework in mind as we go through this presentation. Bad news for the economy is good news for asset prices. All right. If we look at GDP, GDP is what measures economic growth. This is uh, GDP uh, each quarter. So if we look at the, the light blue kind of bars, we can see that it's above zero. So GDP has actually been growing. Um, so the, the government can say, yes, the economy is growing. We haven't crashed everything. We're still going good. It is declining, as you can see. But the real story is in these dark blue bars here. And you can see that they're negative. They're below that zero line. So for the last 12 months, or for all of last year, at the household level or the individual level, our GDP per capita has been negative. And that's because like GDP per capita is is simply like the amount of economic activity, like the GDP divided by the population. So uh, how much of a share of, of the GDP per head in Australia that we get. And you can see at the household and, uh, and the individual level, we've sort of been in a recession for, for 12 months. Uh, a lot of that's because of the, well, nearly all of that is because of the, the immigration rate, which we're about to look at a bit later. But as we spoke about, GDP remains positive, uh, but GDP per capita is negative. And Australia has effectively been in the longest recession um, that it's seen since the, since the 90s. That's the recession that we had to have, um, as Paul Keating said. Okay, now if we go look at household disposable income, uh, this graph here, the, uh, they're sort of the developed economies of the world. That, that red line there is the US. The orange line is OECD countries. The green line is G7 countries. And of course, that blue line is Australia. So what do we notice? So just move this thing out of the way. Um, what do we notice? We can see that um, household disposable income has, has dropped very sharply. And then it bounced very, very quickly in all the, all the developed countries in the world. But what happened to Australia? We've fallen, but we've just been sort of mincing around down here. We haven't bounced. At this point in time, we have the weakest level of household disposable income in, in the developed world. So yay for us. Um, it fell 6% in 2023, and the household sector is exceptionally weak. Now, why is this important? It's because that household consumption, we are a consumption economy, drives 60% of the economy. So 60% of GDP is household consumption. And you can see here that it's basically dead. It's negative it's 6%. 
Okay, now if we look at the unemployment rate, the unemployment rate will invariably rise. Um, this red line here is the unemployment rate. And this blue line here is the forward indicator of the unemployment rate, which is measured by the applications uh, per job add on seek. You can see that the, the forward indicator and the unemployment rate sort of track each other quite nicely, both in, in timing and magnitude. Um, but the, the, the indicator leads the unemployment rate. So what do we notice at the end here though? We see this very, very sharp spike in the forward indicator, but yet the unemployment rate has not risen to meet it. So the jaws have to snap shut. We can expect this unemployment rate to spike up uh, and meet the actual uh, forward indicator. So we can, we saw something similar back here. You saw this, uh, the forward indicator rising quite sharply, yet the unemployment rate sort of did nothing. And then all of a sudden it snapped upwards to meet it. Upwards. Job vacancies fell for seven quarters in a row in February. And at this point in time, we need about 32,000 jobs just to keep the, that we need to create 32,000 jobs just to keep the unemployment rate stable. But if we look, were to look at the leading indicator for jobs, uh, which AMP produces, it shows that jobs growth will slow down to about 12,000 per month, which is about roughly one third of the jobs that are create, that are needed to keep the unemployment rate stable. So once again, it's, an, it's another way to, to show that the unemployment rate will come up. Um, and it's always nice to sort of approach a problem from a few different angles and see that they come to the same conclusion. So when we, we get this kind of convergence in um, in solutions, when we uh, look at a problem from different angles, it's a, it's a very good indicator that we're on the right path. At this current pace, we're gonna see the unemployment rate rise from 3.9% where it is now, uh, up to about 4.8%. And some forecasts uh, say it will be over 5% by the end of 2024. The treasury uh, sort of thinks that in the budget, they thought they they, uh, they forecasted that the unemployment rate would rise to 4.5% by the middle of the year. And that seems to be you know, pretty right to me. Now, that 4.5% is, is a significant number um, because it's considered the, the pace, or it's where the RBA can, considers uh, the unemployment rate to be at a level which does not cause wage inflation. So it sort of stops wage growth. Um, but if you were to look on SEEK, the advertised kind of uh, um, salaries are on SEEK, um, they've actually been falling as well. So, you know, there is some doubt as to whether that 4.5% number is correct. It could be closer to, to 4% or, or could, we, could be that we're actually at 4.5% now, but this is a backwards looking indicator. But either way, uh, we, we're going to see the unemployment rate rise and jobs growth, uh, sorry, and, and uh, wages growth to slow, which is wages growth is kind of the thing that's holding up the economy now. And, and sort of preventing a uh, an interest rate cut. And we'll see why an interest rate cut is important a bit later on. Okay, so we've almost certainly seen the peak of interest rates. Um, this red line here is the CPI, which is the inflation rate. You know, remember we said earlier that you know inflation first flows into asset prices and eventually flows into consumer prices, uh, which is like groceries and, and fuel and so on, and rent. Um, that, that CPI measures those consumer prices. Now the, the RBA's target band is two to 3%, which is sort of from here to here. And if we look at that red uh, CPI number, we can see that they've been remarkably good at sort of keeping it in that two, two to 3% range. Of course, during COVID, they dropped interest rates to zero. Um, oh, what's my mouse gone? Yeah, they dropped interest rates to zero. Um, and and they also used uh, stimulus so quantitative easing, which is effectively like a fancy word for money printing. And we saw CPI jump very, very sharply. Um, but there's one thing to note about CPI. On these extreme sort of inflation impulses, they have a reflexive effect, which means that if they go up by the elevator, they also come down by the elevator. And that's what we're saying around here. Um, we were the only people in Australia saying it at that point in time. Um, I don't know why the RBA doesn't know that, but but it's sort of nice to be to, to be vindicated and see um, CPI falling um, as we predicted. Um, you can see here that the this blue line here is the pipeline inflation indicator. Once again, that's a forward-looking indicator for inflation. 
Uh, and you can see here that it's fallen very, very sharply. It leads the actual red line, the actual CPI by, by about four months. You see it's fallen very sharply. There has been a little blip here because of oil prices. Uh, and then it's continued to fall away. So we're likely to see the CPI uh, continue to fall down into that 2 to 3% range that the RBA is looking for uh, very, very shortly. Those 13 interest rate rises are working. Um, you know, it's it's containing that, that CPI, preventing it from growing, uh, was actually dropping it. Uh, monthly CPI dropped from 8.4%, which was alarmingly high, down to 3.5% in March. And again, this is a backwards-looking indicator. Um, which means that the number that we're working off or that the RBA is working off has already happened. It, it's not the actual number as it is uh, right at this second today. And, um, you know, the, the way the RBA manages the economy is it has to look at these this indicator, which is backwards. And that's sort of analogous to driving down the freeway while looking in the rearview mirror. It's extremely dangerous. It's extremely imprecise. And, and it sort of explains why the RBA is always... Uh, one step behind, they, they, they raise too high and they drop too low uh, pretty much all the time. Um, and, it, and it's likely that inflation could be already under control at this point in time. As we speak, it could be already be in that, touching that 3% range. Um, okay, if we look at the prop property demand, there's high demand <clears throat> at this point in time. Oh, so, so historically, let's say, um, this is the normal immigration rate, sort of at that 90,000 level. Uh, recently, it's in the last 20 years, it's sort of doubled to about 180,000 level. And the reason why the immigration rate is important and the, and the government is sort of incentivized to sort of uh, uh, keep immigration high is because like, like most developed countries, Australia, Australia has a rel relatively low birth rate. It seems like the richer we get, uh, the less kids we have for whatever reason. Um, you know, at this point in time, we, we're having about 1.7 children per woman, and we need about a 2.1 uh, children per woman just, just to keep the, the, uh, the population stable. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and because we can't do that, we sort of have to grow by immigration. And, and that's it's sort of a, a Ponzi scheme, I guess, in a way. Um, it's to stop this demographic time bomb from happening, that the population is aging. And if we don't have enough workers, to support the growing number of pensioners, um, that kind of social security system will collapse. All right, so if we go back to here for a second, 90,000, 180,000, then we saw people leave. So people migrated out of the country uh, during COVID because I thought they'd be locked somewhere forever. They want to go, you know, go home or whatever. And what do we see here? This almost vertical jump in immigration. It is an enormous, enormous spike in immigration. And all these people have to live somewhere. Uh, we're going to have a look at the supply situation next, but you know, we've had this enormous spike in immigration. The population grew by 563,000 uh, in 2023, just from immigration. It is actually closer to 600,000 if you can include birth rates and natural births. And in February, another 100,000 people came in, which was a record monthly high. Um, these kind of spikes in, in immigration are not seen very often. You can see here the post-World War I immigration boom, post-World War II immigration boom. So this is like a wartime type immigration boom. Uh, it is the fastest population growth rate since the 50s. And in financial year 2024, we're expected to hit 410. So that's sort of around this level here. That's actually enormously high as well. 75% of these new, ten, uh, new people that arrive into the country end up in the, in the rental pool and they sort of compete against rents. Uh, and you can sort of imagine what's that, what that is doing to rent. So we looked at demand. Now we're looking at supply. And we can look at supply via dwelling commencements. How many buildings have uh, started being built? This blue line here, this, or this blue, Kind of shaded area is houses, and that uh, dark blue area is is other stuff like units and town townhouses and so on. This is a fairly long graph; it goes back to 1980. <clears throat> but if we sort of concentrate on the more recent stuff, um, as we said, the government dropped interest rates and printed money in, uh, during COVID, and and asset prices started rising. And you can see 
developers rushing to build buildings during that time to capture some of that value as you know as asset prices rise developers uh, want to increase supply as well so that they can they can sell houses in this uh, in this booming market but as interest rates sort of uh, started rising we can see that that has dropped right off and this is it's an extremely sharp decline uh, there's you know there's a very lengthy reasons uh, why this happens uh, which we don't have time to go into but just know that uh, that that dwelling commences dwelling commencements have declined very very sharply the supply has been collapsing since March 2021. Housing approvals are down by 17% just in the last 12 months. And they're currently 30% below underlying demand. That there, that dotted line, is Albo's target. He wants to build uh, 1.2 million properties over the next five years. But if you look at the policies that he's created, it's almost as if he's doing it just to pump up properties says that he's doing it on purpose uh, because he does have a fairly substantial property portfolio. Um, or maybe he's just incompetent, but good luck. He's, he's going to have troubles hitting that target and, and they probably won't hit that until past uh, 2026. Okay, so high, high demand, low supply. What has it done to rents? A lot of you already know. Uh, over the long term, rents increased at somewhere between two and a half to maybe three and a half percent. Um, if we just concentrate on this yellow line for a second, that's the combined uh, house and unit rents. You can see that post COVID, we've had this very, very sharp increase in rents. Heaps of people coming into the country, want to rent houses or want, want to rent properties and there's nothing to rent. So what happens? Rent prices go up. So rents are up 52% in the last three years. Now keep in mind that two and a half to three and a half percent per year is the normal kind of increase and it's up 52% in the last three years. It's up 9%, 9.9%, around 10% just in the last 12 months and around 2.5% in the last quarter. So rents are slowing. Um, they, they are starting to slow down. Like you simply can't sort of uh, increase the housing costs for, for a big, you know, maybe 35% of the population uh, by 50% and expect that they'll continue to be able to pay that. They, they can't. People at renters are sort of hitting their limits on what they can afford. And we'll have a look at that a little bit later. Um, okay. So if we look at house rent, for, uh, house rent forecasts, uh, this is if we drill down a little and look at each capital city. Uh, let's just look at the combined capitals for a second. You can see that these, these bars, this dark blue bar, is the forecast for 2024. That's the forecast for 2025, and that's the forecast for 2026. Um, in 2024, for the remainder of this year, we're going to see continued rent growth uh, somewhere in that 10% uh, range. Um, next year, it'll sort of drop. It'll be above average, around that 4% level for houses, uh, before sort of falling back to the long-term average by 2026. There's two clear winners here, um, Perth and Melbourne. Uh, these are two kind of capital cities where we're heavily involved in at this point in time. Um, and they're seeing some, some amazing rent growth. Now, if we look at units, it's much the same thing. Again, we see if we just look at this combined capitals, the national level, 2024, we'll see about 9% growth. 2025, about 5%, still above long-term average. Uh, and 2026, it will sort of fall down to close around the long-term average. Okay, and this is uh, house prices and interest rates. One of my favorite graphs. Um, let's move this here so I can see it. Move it here. Okay, that, that red line here is interest rates. And that dark blue line is house prices. We've used Sydney house prices simply because it's a good proxy for the rest of the country. Um, <clears throat> It's the, it's the best data set we have. It's the most robust data set we have, it, and it sort of leads the country. So it's a good, it's a nice way to look at it. Um, every property boom or every sharp in, in, impulsive move in property prices has been preceded by a drop in interest rates. It is a very useful indicator. Okay, let's have a look at that throughout time. Here, we see this very sharp 
drop in interest rates in the kind of mid 80s. And then what happened to house prices? If you look at this dark blue, uh, this color, the blue section, we see this sharp increase in house prices. And that doesn't look like a big move. It looks pretty small, um, but that's actually a doubling of house prices over, over about two years. And again, we look here, we see this very sharp drop in uh, interest rates, followed by a sharp move upwards in house prices. And again, that's a doubling of house prices in that period. Again, we see this drop in, in interest rates as the GFC. And again, we see it precedes a sharp rise in house prices. That's again, a doubling of house prices. And what do we see here? Once again, we see this drop in interest rates, this time it was COVID, followed by a sharp increase in house prices. So this is where the data set ends, that's today. Um, you can see that I've, I've sort of extended that uh, blue section a bit further. And that's because this particular cycle hasn't, hasn't finished playing out yet. The, the housing market is sort of caught between two extremely powerful forces at this point in time. Uh, on one hand, we've had these interest rate rises, making borrowing money more expensive, that has pushed house prices down. But at the same time, they've caused this enormous supply demand imbalance, which are sort of pushing prices up. And, and if you notice here, we're actually at all time highs, which means that as the, the supply demand situation is winning, um, and through the previous side, slides, we've seen that we're likely to see an interest rate cut soon, probably in the second half of this year. So we'll see interest rates cut. That might come down one and a half to two percent. And as as the that um, kind of foot is taken off the head of the housing market, we're going to see asset prices or uh, house prices soar. They'll they'll shoot up here. Sydney will probably do fifty to sixty percent over that uh, over the remainder of this cycle, which will end probably sometime in twenty twenty six or twenty twenty seven. Um, and other states will do, you know, varying amounts. Um, some will do better, some will do, do worse. Um, but there is still a, a, a big chunk of growth left in the market. And that's the, the most exciting part of the property cycle, this kind of parabolic move upwards, where we'll sort of see uh, double digit growth, kind of 15 to 20% growth for, for two to three years or sometimes more. Um, yeah, and it'll bring Sydney prices, uh, the median house price, probably over $2 million at, at the end of the cycle. One other thing we notice is that um, these interest rate, this cycle is fairly well spaced. These, if you look at the spacing of these gray bars, that's about a 10 year period. That's about a 10 year period. And that is about a 10 year period. So you see house prices double on average every 10 years. All right, so that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, we're gonna look at a, a few forecasts for the next 18 months. Um, as I said, the housing market is torn between two very powerful forces, um, supply demand versus interest rates. Um, and as interest rates come off, uh, come down, um, we'll see uh, property prices actually start to fly. They, they're already moving quite quickly. Um, the long term, you know, we've done 9% uh, as of last in the last 12 months, and, and that's actually about 30% faster than the long term average. So you know, make no mistake, we are already in the middle of a property boom. It doesn't feel like it. Um, you know, we've had 26 months of, of, of consumer confidence being at recession levels, but that's typically the best time to buy uh, when things are feeling terrible. Uh, we are already in a property boom. Interest rates will fall around the second half of the year, and then we'll see the FOMO kick in, and and uh, and we'll see that those parabolic moves. You sort of want to get in before then. Um, so that to make the most most of your growth. We've seen strong rental growth that is slowing down, um, but it'll remain strong for the remainder of this year and uh, into next year. And at this point in time, demand for property far, far exceeds supply. And as I said, the final move up will be the fastest part of the cycle. All right, that brings me to the end of the presentation, I believe. And I will pass you back to Tony for and you're it for QA. Thank you. Well done, oh, thank you. I don't uh you don't make your um your uh, uh cynicism around government policy uh you know very subtle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, oh, there's a couple of questions in the Q and A box, so I will um, we'll do that live. Uh, what do you think can be done to reduce some of the issues we have with supply? My my personal opinion, and I've been saying this for quite a while, governments need to incentivize suppliers. Yeah. So who are the suppliers? The suppliers are the developers. The problem with that is politically that's very unattractive. Yeah. Um, you know, governments uh, incentivizing greedy, greedy developers to make more millions. And, you know, so the narrative doesn't quite work for governments. But the reality is if they want more property brought to market and brought to market to help ease the pain for the renter and for the first homeowner and for everybody else who's struggling with affordability, they need to incentivize the supplier. So, you know, uh, cutting red tape to improve the approval process. Anyone who knows a developer, anyone who's tried to get a, a, a second story put on their home or a or a driveway done or a, or a balcony done, you know, getting an approval from council is impossible. So that's certainly not going to help. Yeah, uh, and, like to, sorry, sorry go, yeah. you go. Yeah, so I'd just like to add to that. Typically, um, the supply situation gets solved towards the end of the cycle anyway. Like, no matter how it sort of plays out, it sucks until the end of the cycle. Um, when prices sort of are approaching the, the, their peak, um, developers will be building like crazy to, to try and make as much money as they can. And they'll typically overshoot. There'll be a slight oversupply. Um, and then the whole thing begins again. Yeah, but it's not getting solved till 2026, likely. So I think the answer to that is they need to incentivize the supplier, they need to cut some red tape, and they need to incentivize them financially. And, and that might mean, you know, cutting their council contributions and the government contributing that. Um, and the challenge, one of the challenges, of course, is that approvals are done by local council. The housing issue is a federal issue. Uh, the state jumps in with their land tax, uh, you know, um, um, uh, issues and situations and and trying to, you know, what they call in the COVID tax in Victoria, for example. So there are so many different variables impacting the decision making. Now, who is that good for? It's good for whoever owns the property at the moment. Yeah. Uh, who is it not good for? It's not good for people who are renting a property at the moment because the undersupply is going to continue to put pressure on, on prices as a result of low supply. Um, another question there is, would you believe the market uh, in Melbourne is very different from Sydney regarding where they are in the cycle? You want to answer that, Gav? Yeah, so typically no. Um, right now, the, Melbourne is lagging behind. Um, they, they have a range of, of taxes sort of holding it back. Uh, and at this point in time, we, we can sort of see capital diverting away into, into other markets. But as there's, there's a massive a gap now between Sydney and, and Melbourne, and as other markets, so money sort of flows to where they think the, the best returns will be. Um, and as, as other prices rise, they'll money will invariably flow back into Melbourne. So we'll probably see a very sharp late pump to the Melbourne market uh, where it catches up and, and always does that every cycle. Um, you know, I, I have a regression analysis, which is like a, like a way to look at... Um, uh, how how undervalued a market is, and Melbourne is deep below the regression line, so it's actually very very undervalued at this point in time. Um, yeah, it will catch up. Yeah, so, to, uh, support, to support that, to give you a bit of an idea, Melbourne's median house price is floating around a million dollars. Hmm. Okay. Sydney's median house price is one point six two million. Yeah. So if we want to use some quick maths, as my kids would say. Uh, Sydney is 62% more expensive than Melbourne. That is absolutely outrageous and, and illogical. On the basis that the Melbourne and Sydney populations are very similar, on the basis that the Melbourne economy is as strong as the Sydney economy or certainly the Victorian economy and the New South Wales economy. In fact, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Gav, the Victorian economy contributes more to the national GDP than the New South Wales economy does. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Victorian economy is bigger than Singapore's, it's bigger than the Philippines, bigger than New Zealand's. So 
it makes no sense that Sydney is 62% more expensive. And someone um, has asked, what's our prediction for the Melbourne market? My prediction for the Melbourne market is that it will explode out of the blocks after this um, uh, period of, of sort of dampening uh, on the back of, you know, the political unrest down there, the COVID uh, hangover, the now the land tax implications. And for those of you who have decided, oh, I'm not going to buy an investment property in Melbourne because I don't want to pay land tax, don't be silly. Don't cut your nose off to spot your face. You know, uh, 20 or 25 years ago, a uh, median house in Melbourne was about 160 grand. Now it's close to a million. So if someone had decided at that time they weren't going to buy a property because they didn't want to pay a few hundred dollars in land tax, they'd be kicking themselves now. Yeah? So once rates fall and rents continue to rise, um, that land tax will be more than covered in your cash flow. It's not, a, it's not an issue. Um, Gav Nurit, there's a question here from Suji. Hope I pronounced that right. With the interest rates high, what would your advice on keeping the investor with the payment and keep the existing property? It would be hard to expand the property portfolio the property owner can't keep the existing property. Uh, Suji, that's very much an individual thing. My recommendation to everybody is please, please, please do not sell your property in this market. Hold it. Number one, it's a very average market to be selling a property in, right? The sentiment is low. Everybody's a little bit nervous. Rates are high. You saw what Gavin said earlier. History shows in Australia that every significant property price increase in our history has been preceded by an interest rate fall. Well, we're very close to an interest rate fall. Anyone who sells their property in this market right now is going to kick themselves. Now, for those of you who have to sell, sure, you have to sell, right? Uh, divorce, illness, uh, uh, redundancy, whatever it is that causes you to have to sell, we understand. But do not sell because you're worried about where the market's going, okay? Just wait. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to add to that. If uh, if cash flow becomes an issue, you can, you can apply for, I think it's called an income tax withholding variation form, or it might be called a PAYG withholding variation form now. Yeah. Um, which sort of spreads your tax return throughout your year. So it helps, you know, if you're going to get a 20 grand tax return from your property, it sort of spreads that through your wages throughout the year. So it helps you hold it. Um, yeah, that's something you can do. Hold on to your properties. Yeah. Okay. We had a question come in uh, with, with one of our landlords that can't be here today. And it's a very common one. Um, ultimately, a lot of our clients, as you know, we have a lot of apartments on our books. Our landlords are mostly apartment owners. Um, many of these apartments have not yet gone up in value um, over the last five to eight years. Some of them have gone a little bit even backwards. Um, why is that happening when all we're hearing about is supply issues and, and the fact that um, affordability is an issue? You'd think that um, apartments would be really appealing to a lot of people to buy. Yep, and they, and they will be. Yeah, and I know those of you who have held them for a little bit longer than you would have thought before they gave you some growth um, are a bit frustrated. Um, I, I get it, yeah. I own several apartments in Melbourne. I own in South Melbourne. I own uh, three in Footscray. I own in North Melbourne. I own in Alphington. So I'm a big fan of Melbourne, and that market will do its job. The reason why it hasn't done its job yet is because there's been a lot of noise, you know, government, COVID, now land tax, interest rates, been a lot of noise. And eventually the market will get through that noise. And then all of that stuff that Nurit just mentioned, strong yields, low supply, affordability, will start to really pay off for those of you who are patient enough to wait for it. Okay? And I talk you know, to clients about that all the time. Yeah. Also, if you just look at the uh, the graphs of, of how the property market actually grows it typically does nothing for ages does nothing and then it does most of its growth in about three to four years or sometimes two to three years um so you just have to hold it long enough to see out the that that growth period um you know sometimes it can be a wait sometimes it can be boring um but yeah you just have to have to hang on to it I've got one more question. Um, any advice for our renters? Um, it's obviously becoming less and less affordable uh, as rents are going up. They're still cheaper than buying a property. What would you do as a renter who's got a small deposit but not enough to buy where they want to be? What would they be doing right now? 
Uh, that's a tough one. I mean, I, for me, obviously, there are the obvious ones around, you know, sharing and moving back in with parents and saving more. And But in terms of uh, what we're doing with a lot of our clients now, it's probably the fastest growing part of the industry, you know, is, is rent vesting. So instead of them buying, saving and saving and saving to buy a house um, that now is a million bucks or 800000 or 900000 they might... Um, invest in a property which uh, which will earn rent. Obviously, that increases their borrowing capacity and all the debt is tax deductible. So they rent where they want to live and they invest somewhere else. So that's certainly been a massive, um, uh, there's been a massive movement um, in New South Wales, in Sydney now for a, more than a decade because obviously Sydney is even less affordable than Melbourne. So for those Melbourne renters who are feeling sorry for themselves because they're trying to get to buy an eight hundred thousand dollar house, have a think about your Sydney counterparts, where the eight hundred thousand dollar house is one point five million. I live twenty kilometers from the city, in an area that probably could be compared to like Ivanhoe. You know, beautiful suburbia, middle class. It's uh, the suburb's called Epping, and our median house price here is two point seven million. It is absolutely absurd. So, yeah, rent vesting would be my recommendation, uh, along with uh, uh, those other bits and pieces, you know, sharing, moving to a cheaper suburb, moving back in with your parents, you know, get a boyfriend or girlfriend that can contribute. Yeah, they're cash flow positive. They don't, they save more than they spend. Yeah, marrying the right person is the highest ROI you can make. <laughs> um, I've got one last question here. Your view on the Melbourne industrial and commercial property I'm assuming that's meant to be on North, uh, Melbourne, yeah, industrial. Yeah, community. so the, the commercial property sector has been smashed. Um, like certainly the office spaces have been smashed. Uh, you see this rise in working from home. Uh, retail has been smashed. Retail, I didn't show that slide, but it, it's a uh, retail volumes per capita is down by 6.5%. Um, oh, sorry, 5.7% now. But that's in line with a deep retail recession. That, so that's getting smashed as well. Um, industrial will, probably, will likely do better. Uh, and, and it's holding up a bit better. Um, that's because we have a rise in online kind of businesses, there's a rise in warehousing space and so on. Um, the the sort, the most desirable stuff is kind of the bigger stuff. It's ex the more expensive stuff, stuff, 2,000 square meters of warehouse space and, and above. Um, yeah, so it's, ex it's, it's expensive to get into, but that's the area that will, that will likely do the best. But right now, everything's down pretty hard. So someone's made a comment there, buy with a close friend or family member. Uh, I would always say uh, be cautious when you do that because for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, if you've got uh, different goals or you end up in different places, that, that, that obviously creates some tension. If you're going to do that, make sure the rules are clear up front. Number two, when you borrow money with a friend or family from the bank, let's say you buy a house and you borrow 700000 uh, the bank will assume it won't assume that you owe 350 each. It will assume that you both owe 700. It's called joint and several debt. So be very careful about um, about buying property with uh, with somebody else where you don't own 100 percent of the asset. What about combining super? Uh, super is another great option. Uh, you can buy property in your self managed super fund if you probably need. If you combine it, you can have up to six members in your fund. So as you know, Narit, I own four of my properties in my SIP fund with my wife, my parents, and two of my children. Um, so you can have up to six members. You combine all of your super, and then you can use that money to buy a property. Um, the beauty about buying in super, of course, is when you sell it in retirement, it's tax deductible. But it isn't for everybody, and you need to get good advice. Uh, we've, we've got an event coming up where we're talking about investing in super. So um, stay tuned. You'll hear from Motion about it at some point. All right. Well, at, at this point, we'll wrap it up. I wanted to thank you both. Always very knowledgeable. I'm always learning something. I'm sure our attendees have as well. Um, we appreciate your time. We will send out um, a feedback form for everyone attending today. If you would like to speak to Blue Wealth, please pop your details down and we will get a member of their team to call you back and discuss anything further you want to talk about. Thank you so much. Pleasure, Nerit. Thank, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Bye. Bye. See you later. Bye.